The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Well, good morning. We're continuing our study on Ezekiel. And last time um, I spoke to you, I said I was going to cover seven points, and I covered three, four of those points. So today we're going to cover the final two points, and then some, the last two points that we will cover today are the whirlwind, cloud, fire, and the glory that's point five. Six is the living creatures. Seven, eagles' wings, hands, and calves' feet. The new ones that we did not cover last time will be the four wheels of the cherubim and the throne of God. So that will be a total of nine in these two messages, and we're staying all in chapter 1 of Ezekiel for this. And by the way, chapter 1 of Ezekiel has been called the deepest chapter in the whole Bible. And if you start studying it, it's sort of interesting how different people have taught it. Um, but based on Scripture interpreting Scripture, the viewpoint that I will be giving today giving today is the one accepted by a plurality of scholars okay so we talked about Ezekiel last time and we mentioned that there are four primary sections in Ezekiel section one is the first chapter the vision of the glory section two Chapters 2 through 32 is the judgment of God. Section 3, chapters 33 through 39, is recovery by life. Recovery by life. And section 4 is the building of God. That's chapters 40 through 48. Section 1, Chapter 1, Vision of Glory. Section 2, Chapters 2 through 32, Judgment of God. Section 3, Chapters 33 to 39, Recovery by Life. And Section 4, Chapters 40 through 48, The Building of God. Now the first thing I'm going to be covering today is the whirlwind, the cloud, the fire, and the glory. Verse 4 of Ezekiel chapter 1. Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness, or the glory, was all around it, radiating out of its midst like the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Now, this was a cloud of glory, but it was more than just a cloud because it says it was a whirlwind, and one person, when one translation, called it a spirit storm. I like that. We want to be visited by a spirit storm, the cloud of glory. Now, this signifies, of course, the glory of God. It rested upon Mount Sinai. The glory came into the tabernacle of Moses. The glory filled Solomon's temple. And on the day of Pentecost, this spirit storm of glory entered into the hearts of believers and tongues of fire rested upon their heads. It's a whirlwind. Speaking of divine agitation, speaking of movement, it came out of the north, the place of God's throne. Psalm 48, 2. Beautiful in elevation, 
the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. It was a fire enfolding itself. Fire is a symbol of the holiness of God. We saw, the, we saw the fire at the burning bush and, of course, the tongues of fire we just mentioned. Hebrews 12, 29 says, Our God, God is a consuming fire. The brightness speaks of the majesty, the light, the brightness of God's being, the unapproachable light in which God dwells. 1 Timothy 6, 16. And the whole description is symbolic of what we call in charismatic circles and Pentecostal circles, the Shekinah glory of God. That's not the way you pronounce the Hebrew, but I've only heard one Jewish uh, Messianic speaker pronounce it the right way, so we'll just call it the Shekinah glory. Also, the pillar of fire that led the Israelites in the wilderness by night. Now, clouds signify divine transport and the chariot of God. Psalm 68, 2 says, extol him who rides on the clouds. Psalm 104, 3 says, he makes the clouds his chariot. And Exodus, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, behold, I come to you in a thick cloud. And he rested upon Mount, Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And the glory cloud rested over the blood-stained mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant between the outstretched wings of the cherubim whose faces were down looking at the plan of redemption through Jesus. Verse 5 the living creatures, also from within the fire came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces, and each one had four wings. Now, there are two main views about the cherubim. The, the angelic view Many look at the cherubim as a special category of angel. Well, you know what? That's the thing I would like the least because, I mean, that's cool information. But how does that apply to us? That was one thing that John Wesley said in his quadrilateral when he talked about ways to test things in the church. That one way you test things is, is it something that can be actually experienced? Well, some people see angels. I don't see angels, although I've felt their presence before. But I can't experience an angel. It can't really apply to me. It can impact me. But the next view is the redeemed mankind view. And way back many years ago, um, I read somebody who said that this represented overcomers in the church. And so I got out my Vines Expository Dictionary and I looked up the word that's used in our English translations, cherubim. And here's what Vines said. In the tabernacle and temple, the cherubim were represented by two golden figures of two-winged living creatures. They were all of one piece with the golden lid of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, signifying that the prospect of redeemed and glorified creatures was bound up with the sacrifice of Messiah. This in itself would indicate that they, that they represent redeemed human beings in union with Messiah, a union seen figuratively proceeding out of the mercy seat. Their faces toward the mercy seat suggest a consciousness of the means by which union with the Messiah has been produced. Well, that seems to settle it pretty much 
for me. But then if you look back at the Hebrew word life, which is chai, C-H-A-I, and it was living creatures, chai, chai, that means alive, life, living. It does not apply to angelic beings at all. It applies to living things on planet Earth. So cherubim are not spirit beings or angels, but people who are redeemed by Messiah. Now, the redeemed mankind view. This view has the most weight of scripture on its side. We should definitely pay attention to that. The symbol symbolic language used of these living creatures is never, not ever used of angelic beings anywhere in the Bible. However, such language is used about Jesus and about his saints. So the four living creatures represent people. And they're described in symbolic language. And by the way, we are saved and our spirit is given life, but it's in seed form. The Bible all ta also talks about being filled with the fullness, coming to full stature. There is a process of growth in us so that the life that's in our spirit can impact our soul and eventually saturate our entire being. To be fully alive. These living creatures here in Ezekiel are fully alive. And you know, if we can look at it also like a seed, when it breaks open and the taproot goes down, it has life. It's living, it's growing into something, but it's a long time sometimes for that seed to come to full expression. We have a tree in our front yard, and when they, I'd asked for a tree to be planted, but it was such a little stick. I thought, oh, that must, that's a bush. That couldn't possibly be a tree. I want to tell you what, if I'd known that tree was going to get so big, I don't think I would have had it planted right in front of our house. It's huge now. So we start out small in the spirit, but we want to grow really big. Now, the wings that they had, it says there were four. Oh, well, before I go any further, we also see creatures somewhat like this in the book of Isaiah and in the book of Revelation. In Isaiah and Revelation, they have six wings. Now, they have four wings here and six wings there. They need the other wings to cover their faces so they can be in the presence of God. But these are the seraphim of Isaiah and the living creatures of the book of Revelation as well. Now, four. They had four wings. Now, what is that symbolic of? Four is the number of earth. Four, by the way, is not speaking of angelic beings. Four is speaking of a creation. Created being on earth. Four is the number of the earth, and it speaks also, especially here in Ezekiel, of worldwide, the four corners of the earth. In other words, we have been given a universal ministry that stretches as far around the world as God wants to take us. And living creature, a created being, alive, active, not dead their appearance all had the appearance of a man now man is the highest of God's creatures the masterpiece of God's creation made in the image of God and the king of creation under God Genesis 1 26 through 27 and their faces four faces there's some interesting artistic depictions where people have attempted to um, represent this in 
picture for him, and some of it's, some of it's pretty interesting. If you look up, um, look up images of Ezekiel's visions. First of all, the four faces represent Jesus. Aspects of the four Gospels in the glory of Jesus our Redeemer. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus our Messiah. Each Gospel represents some aspect of the glory of God in Jesus. In Matthew, it's Messiah the Lion, Son of David, God's King. In Mark, it's Messiah the Ox, the Son of Man, God's Servant. Luke, Messiah the Man, the Son of Adam, God's Perfect Man. John, Messiah the Eagle, the Son of God, God Incarnate. Well, that's awesome to study and read the Gospels and notice and notice those aspects that are being emphasized by the Gospels. But it can also be applied to the saints. Four character qualities that we that should be part of us, that should be, should be represented before the world, to be expressed before the world. First of all, the lion, the king of beasts, Proverbs 28.1 says the righteous are bold as a lion. We need to work on that boldness and yield to Jesus and let him be bold through us. Believers should not be wimps. We should be bold in him. The calf, the king of domestic beasts. 1 Corinthians 9, 9-10, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, speaking of believers who are servants of the Lord, that, in other words, that they deserve to be compensated when they minister and speak and have speaking engagements, that it's right that they should be supported by the work of the gospel if God has called them to that. In Luke, Messiah the man, son of Adam, God's perfect Man, the Jesus who lived the fruit of the Spirit in his daily life. Most of his life was in regular daily life. Going to the school in the synagogue with the other boys. Working with his father as a stonemason in their building business. Chores at home. You suppose that all... Um, that Jesus and all his brothers and sisters had chores at home. I want to tell you that I'm sure that they did. And in all of this, Jesus lived out the fruit of the Spirit, and in his divine humanity, he lived a perfect life. And he is our example that we too, listen, it's not just flashy gifts it's not just in speaking. It's not just in singing. But God counts how we live our daily lives. It says in Leviticus, it talks about Jesus as the meal offering. This is where they ground the wheat into flour. And it says it was fine flour ground finely. There weren't any clumps or rough things in that flour and this was used to make bread and offer it to God and in Corinthians it says that we are one loaf we are one loaf and we individually and corporately should be like that fine flour with our will perfectly yielded to the Lord in everything we do The man, the king of creation. Saints are made in the image of God. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Who do we express? We're to express Jesus in our lives. People are to look at us and our words and our actions 
and see Jesus in us, the expression of God radiating through us. Finally, the eagle, the king of birds. Isaiah 40, 31, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. And this speaks of kingship royalty, typical of Messiah and his church. And finally, the living creatures, it says, were birthed out of the fire. They were birthed from the glory. That's what we're going for, for the calling for the glory of God to come, that a company of people will be birthed out of the glory. The living creatures had eagle's wings, man's hands, and calf's hoofs. The eagle's wings, we've talked about wings a little bit, transport, covering, protection, and of course, eagle's wings signify power, strength, and divine supply. Deuteronomy 32, 11, it says, Like an eagle stirs up its nest that hovers over its young, God spread his wings and caught them. He carried them on his pinions. Jeremiah 49, 22, He will mount up and swoop like an eagle. And this is a warrior eagle and spread out his wings against Bozrah. That was the hometown of King Jobab of Edom. There's your Edom. There's your strength. And the hearts of the mighty men of Edom in that day will be the, like the heart of a woman in labor. So this is God. And the eagle's wings are not human wings. They're supernatural wings. So like God, we can have wings too. And finally, the protection of the wings. Psalm 63, 7 says, Because you have been my help in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. So we have God's wings over us, and we have wings to be our flight and to be our peace and to soar. Even though the earth is pretty messy, we can soar above it. Eagles soar above the turmoil down on the earth and we too are to soar and we receive supernatural wings Isaiah 40 31 will mount up with wings like eagles and they also had man's hands they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides that's verse 8 hands are symbolic of service God uses our hands to reach others and also clean hands are needed in God's presence. Psalm 24, 3 through 4. Who may ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And they had calves feet. That's verse 7. Their feet were straight feet and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. Of the four faces, only the calf has straight feet. Men's feet are bent at an angle. Lions have paws. Eagles have claws. But a calf has a straight foot. This indicates that their walk is straight, not crooked. They don't veer from God's path. It says the feet are like burnished brass. Brass is symbolic of burning judgment against sin. And their walk, it says they went straight forward without turning. Luke 9, 62, Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Hebrews 12, 13 in the Phillips translation says, Don't wander away from the path, but forge steadily onward. And Psalm 85, 3 says righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. Listen to that. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. And we're to stay in the center of the path of God. Isaiah 30, 21 says, Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way walk in it when we're walking in the will of god we walk in his footsteps we don't veer off the path 
and their speed. They were running. They were moving like the speed of light. Moved like a flash of lightning. That's pretty fast. So God, with these living creatures with him, could cover the whole earth like the flash of lightning. Their brightness, those who come out of the fire are overcomers. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. Now, there are a couple of verses in Psalm 104, 4. It says, Who makes his angel spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. And some people have wondered, does that mean the angels are his ministers? Who is he talking? Who is this talking about here? Now, this is repeated in Hebrews 1, 6 through 8. Who makes his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Now, if you look up the Greek word for minister used here, it means a public minister like a servant of the state. It's used for one, military laborers. It's used for one busy with holy things like a priest or servants of a king. Well, you know, we're military laborers. We're busy with holy things, and we're also servants of the king. So the fullness of that word applies to us. So that's talking about people who become flames of fire. The living creatures were flames of fire. And it also, the sons of God, the servants, the, uh, excuse me, the overcomers in Revelation... Speak of the sons of God, speaking of activity, function, co-laborers with God, which the living creatures certainly were. But also, we are sons of God, but we are also the bride of Messiah, looking to the overcomer, the Shulamite maiden in the Song of Solomon, speaking of intimacy, Lovers of God, you've got to have both. You can't just have function. You can't just have activity. You have to have that heart relationship. Be a son, yes, but also be a bride. And there's a... The overcomers are the ones who walk in the full weight of God's glory. 1 Thessalonians 2.12 Paul beseeches the believers to walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and his glory. Walk worthy in the footnote in the spirit-filled Bible. Walk worthy means to walk in the full weight of God's glory. So who is Paul speaking to here? He's not speaking to what the Apostle John would call little children. He's speaking up to those who have come up to full stature, who are overcomers, who have come to the glory. And, by the way, the quality of those who come to the father level is that they are no longer lovers or lovers of self. They are God's instrument to love others. That's the whole focus of their life, is to love God and love other people. The mainspring of self is broken. The overcomers. Also says in verses 13 through 15 that they were burning coals and flaming torches. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning, and the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flashing lightning. Because the living creatures were birthed out of the fire of God's glory, they became burning coals. And flaming torches. There was a fire within them, upon them, and among them. Because they're one with God, God comes in his fire, and they become burning coals. Now, burning coals in us does three things. 
It burns out everything negative or impure. It burns out everything negative. It makes us exceedingly hot. Remember in the letter to the Laodicean church, they had become lukewarm. They were no longer burning. And that was one of the rebukes. And I think a lot of the church world today is as we look around our nation and, and consider the state of the church in the world, I believe a lot of the church is lukewarm now, and God wants us to be exceedingly hot. He wants us to have burning spirits. The coals also generates the impact and power of the church. How much do you think the church is actually impacting society around us? We need to be burning coals. Now, fire moves. It doesn't stay still. It's always moving because God himself is the fire. They're also called torches. Coals burn, but torches give life. The sanctifying fire becomes the sanctifying light. If the fire burns in us, we will be more and more enlightened. The more intensely the fire burns in the church, the brighter it will shine. Corners and shadows will become bright. Things that were once hidden will be revealed. Now the coordination of the living creatures. There was a book I read as a baby Christian. It was called Reese Howell's Intercessor by Norman Grubb. And I still go back and reread it on a pretty regular basis. Um, part of the problem, though, is the word intercessor, because we think of intercessor as someone who goes in their prayer closet and prays all the time. However, this is an Inter word intercessor really means somebody who stands in the gap and makes up the hedge, who closes the distance between heaven and earth and becomes God's instrument to do whatever God wants on earth. We know that um, Reese Howells in this book functioned as a healer at times, bringing healing. He became a father to orphans. God's had him meet multiple needs. Only toward the end of the book does he function more like what we would call a true intercessor, not just a prayer warrior, but an intercessor. And God baptized a whole company from his Bible college at Wales into an organism to pray and turn the course of World War II. And that is absolutely fascinating it said in there that God spoke and said that they were praying about Hitler and God made it so he didn't listen to the voice that guided him and he made a crucial mistake it was the only time it said that anybody knows about that Hitler did not obey the demonic voice that was speaking to him okay but being baptized into a... They were baptized into a company of living creatures to carry out God's purposes. Now, in verse, verses 7... 11, excuse me, verse 11 through 14, it says, Their wings stretched upward. Two wings of each one touched one another. Two covered their bodies, and each one went straight forward. They went wherever the Spirit wanted to go. They did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches. Nowhere else in the Bible is the principle of coordination or one accord explained in such a specific and practical way. Of their two wings... Now, two were for covering, and two were for moving. And it says their wings touched one another. They were connected. They moved as a unit. They moved as a unit. The moving was unified and harmonized. And we know that unity 
is of great importance in the church. Just do a study in the New Testament of what God says about unity. You might want to look for the word unity and, and copy and paste the words on that, the uh, verses for that, and then read over what God says. 1 Corinthians 1, 10, and I mean, there are so many of them that uh, I just picked a few out, but pages and pages. 1 Corinthians 1, 10, it's Paul speaking. I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and spirit. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6 says, I urge you, speak, Paul is speaking, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called in all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. All. And then, of course, we know that on the day of Pentecost that the believers in the upper room were praying in one accord, perfectly knit in their hearts. Now, so why do we need to be coordinated? I think it's pretty obvious. We must be unified to be one with God and with one another. In that way, Jesus is expressed and manifested. In that way, the world will believe. John, Jesus' prayer in John 17. This long chapter, I think it's at the very core of the New Testament. I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one that the world may know that you have sent me. I would say that's pretty important. The living creatures are coordinated so that God can move and act on earth. God needs his gap standers, those who will be joined to heaven while they're living on earth that God can work through because God works through people. God works through our prayers. He works through our spirit-led actions. So the four wheels of the cherubim, verses 15 through 21. Now, as I looked at the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on earth beside each living creature with its four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their workings were like the color of beryl, and all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their workings was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they moved, they went toward any one of four directions. They did not turn when they went. As for their rims, they were so high they were awesome. And their rims were full of eyes all around the four of them. When the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Symbolizing the chariot of God. It's um, a movable throne. God's ruling, God's throne. And wherever they go, as the Spirit leads them, they bring the kingship of God. They were in union with the wheels, bringing heaven to earth. The rims of the wheels. Now, in the in, in some pictures that you look up um, of images of Ezekiel's visions, the wheels are little. But here it says they were so high they were fearful. Why are they so high? Because they connect heaven and earth. Speaks of God as 
infinite, whose center is everywhere, and her circumference reaches everywhere in the universe. The eyes of the wheels, eyes meaning insight, perception, discernment, perfect sight. The living creatures knew the purposes of God as they related to the things of eternity. And there was a spirit in them. They were joined to the Lord in one spirit. They were one with the Lord in purpose, attitude, and direction. And by the way, in the Song of Solomon, when Dennis teaches, taught on the Song of Solomon, it speaks about the Shulamite became a bed. That means resting in the Lord, joined with him. And then that bed became a uh, the old fashioned word is a palanquin now a palanquin is a covered vehicle that used to be carried that somebody royal would sit inside it and it was movable it was carried by mighty men so this was this is not just God's throne that in Revelation 3 21 it says that those who overcome will be seated together with Jesus on his throne. So there's a place for us. We don't just come to the throne of God. We can become movable carriers of the throne of God. Now let's speak of the throne of God. The firmament. And the likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures was like the color of an awesome great and fearful crystal stretched out over their heads in ezekiel 1 22 through 25 we're told that there was a great expanse of sky something different from the sky that we see as we look up there was something supernatural this crystal stretches out to a great expanse and it was both visible and transparent when we're right with God, we have a clear sky that gives us access to him. Our sky is the story of our conscience. When our conscience is not clear, the sky over us is dark and cloudy. Have you ever had something that troubled your conscience and you tried to go pray and you couldn't feel any sense of the presence of God until you cleared your conscience? The sky over you became dark and cloudy at that time. But praise God, we have forgiveness and we can get right with God again. Then the obedience of the living creatures. They didn't question. They didn't veer off the path. Verses 23 through 25 says, And under the firmament their wings spread out straight one toward another, each one had two which covered one side. Each one had two which covered the other side of a body. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of many waters, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult, like the noise of an army. And when they stood still, they let down their wings. A voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads. And when, whenever they stood, they let down their wings. God's voice became their voice as they moved and the sound of the wings went forward declaring God's voice and the voice that comes out of the wings is the testimony of the living creatures it's a testimony of their union with God a testimony of their obedience to God and a testimony of their wills that are completely surrendered to God and this voice was strong having the sound of great waters and the sound of an army. And Ezekiel didn't just see this. He heard the sound. It was the voice of God himself expressed through his surrendered and coordinated people. When they lifted up their wings, they then expressed God's voice. When they listened to God, they let down their wings they knew how to speak, and they knew how to listen. And then the Lord's throne, verse 26, and above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne, like the appearance of a sapphire stone. Sapphire stone speaks of blue, 
heavenly. And when we have a clear sky, we also have a throne above the clear sky. The throne is the center of the universe. We should be under the ruling of the Lord's throne all the time. However, it's true that many believers rule their own lives most of the time. That's not to say they're sinning most of the time. They're simply exercising their own preferences and speaking their own opinions. We need to make sure we have the throne with us in all our doings, all our preferences, and all our speaking. I remember when we, um, when Dennis and I were looking for a house, we'd been living in Rock Hill for a year, and Dennis's parents, we were talking about Dennis's parents coming down and living with us, so we knew we'd have to have a house that could accommodate that. And so, oh, we looked and looked and looked, almost bought one house, and we were sitting in the closing, and the realtor messed up the whole thing, and the builder we were buying from was furious. I mean, he scuttled the whole thing. It was just amazing. Now, one pastor had already come down from Connecticut and said, I think God's got something better. But God just really scuttled that thing. And so, and so then, then we, weren't, we went looking and we found a house under construction at the Lord's direction. We were talking about, a, uh, oh, I pulled up a, a particular subdivision and the power of God filled the room. And so he led us to the house and, and all that. But I was looking for, we wanted, God, where is the house you've already chosen for us? We didn't do things like, oh, you got to have a front porch. I hate it when you come in the door and, you you know, it's raining and you can't get the, you know, key in the door fast enough and all that. Actually, we don't have a front porch, and I would have liked one, but it's not our preferences. It's what God wants. The living creatures have come under the throne so thoroughly that they are living heavenly ascension life. They become so surrendered to the Lord that they live in constant obedience to him they become co-laborers with God it reminds me of in uh, the book of the song of Solomon where at the end of the book the Shulamite and her beloved are going out together and she says let us go look at the vineyards let us let us so everything done in union with the Lord such overcoming believers can be trusted with the deep things of God because they have presented their lives as living sacrifices. Romans 12, 1. Present your body a living sacrifice. Now, as Catherine Kuhlman said, it will cost you everything. But then she said, but apart from God, I don't have anything anyway. And that is so true. That is so true. Now, by the way, in the story in Isaiah, we see the whole process of really becoming a living sacrifice. He had the experience of the throne, and he cooperated. Isaiah 6, uh, 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. Now, the difference is Isaiah was taken to the throne room in heaven. And the train of his robe, which can also be translated, the rays of his glory filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each had six wings. And they cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I, Isaiah, said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it. And said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, 
Here am I, send me. That's a living sacrifice. The living creatures function as an extension of the throne of God. They live on earth as citizens of a heavenly world. And then Ezekiel saw a man on that throne. He saw the king that Isaiah saw. Verses 26 through 27. On the likeness of the throne was the likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Also from the appearance of his waist and upward, I saw as it were the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire with brightness all around it. The man sitting on the throne, of course, was the Lord Jesus. The appearance of fire signifies the holiness, glory, and righteousness of God. The throne signifies not only God ruling over us, but also the fulfillment of his eternal purpose. If we submit to the rule of our Lord, he can fulfill his purposes in and through us. What what an amazing thing we have been offered. No wonder Catherine Kuhlman was amazed. She said, and I was chosen simply because someone else did not take this mantle. Let's accept our mantles. I don't want to be left out. If we want God's plans and purposes to be carried out in us, we must submit to the reign of God. Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you. This is in the Amplified. To make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. In other words, this makes perfect sense that you do this. And the throne was transmitted to earth through the living creatures. Now, this transmission is like the transmission of electricity. Now, uh, we have different power Plants, one in Charlotte, one that supplies electricity down in Fort Mill. And if we're hooked up to that power plant, electricity is transmitted into our homes and businesses. Now, the living creatures are heavenly electrical lines transmitting the power of God to earth. God's electrical transmitters there. The throne is with them wherever they go. The power, glory, and authority of the throne follows them and is released by them and through them wherever they go. How much does our world need living sacrifices? How much does our world need overcomers, need living creatures to bring God's throne to earth? There are a lot of prophetic voices out there um, that I've been listening to. And, you know, a lot of the things they say sound you know, impossible. How could God ever do that? Well, I want to tell you, read ahead in Ezekiel, the next chapters in the second section, and read it with new eyes. Look at what God does. And, you know, most of this was done in Ezekiel's lifetime it's possible all of it was done with, within his lifetime, but then we have no record of how long he lived. He was about 50 at the conclusion of the book of Ezekiel, and we don't know how long he lived after that. He could have seen all of that come to pass, all of that impossible-sounding stuff come to pass in his lifetime. It's amazing what God can do. I mean, he says he put hooked puts hooks in the jaws of kings and leads them to do things that he truly does sit in the heavens and laughs as the heathen rage and devise their schemes. He's sitting up there laughing now. I wonder how much we're going to see that we can relate to what God did in Ezekiel that we're going to see in our lifetimes. And we're going to say, silly me, for wondering if God could change that, if God could fix that. Uh, I remember Dennis and I were 
uh, we'd been talking about the state of the world. We had brunch with Sid and Joy up in Charlotte, and we were, I mean, we were talking about the state of the world and felt kind of down. And so we were riding home under a little bit of pressure. You know, how could God fix this and how could God fix that? And God spoke to us both at exactly the same time. This was, I believe it was June 21st of 2020. And God said, watch what I will do. And I've got that up on my refrigerator. <laughs> God is going to amaze us. God is going to amaze us. And I'm saying, God, I want to be one of those living sacrifices that you work through as you accomplish some of this amazing stuff that you're going to do. Now, the rainbow. Like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the brightness, the appearance of the brightness. Now, the brightness around the throne was like a rainbow. And you know, when light passes through a prism, it's split into three major colors, red, yellow, and blue, and seven minor colors. Red stands for the holiness of God. Yellow stands for the glory of God. And blue stands for the righteousness of God. And the rainbow is a reminder of the faithfulness of a covenant keeping God. Not only is he a God who does wonders and who can turn a nation around with a snap of his fingers, but he's a covenant keeping God. In Genesis 9, the rainbow is first mentioned with Noah after the flood. And it says, the rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant. The everlasting covenant. Revelation 4, 3, there was a rainbow around the throne. Revelation 10, 1, I saw another mighty angel speaking of Messiah and a rainbow was on his head. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Now, finally, verse 28, the final verse of chapter 1. What did Ezekiel do at this? Verse 28, so when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. The chapter, uh, chapter 1 of Ezekiel is, as I said, the deepest chapter in the Bible. We've seen that God's grace can be poured out on a company of people to such an extent that they are transformed into a heavenly people, a company of people perfectly lined up with God. Because of the living creatures, now this is a, a quote, because of the living creatures, God is not only the God of heaven, but also the God of earth. Through these living creatures who have the throne over their heads, heaven and earth are joined. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's intention is to work on man in order that man can be on the throne. Revelation 3.21 To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. God has chosen us. He has called us to his throne. I think it would be a good time to let the Holy Spirit search our heart and see what do we need, all right? Because we've said from the initiation of the church, and I've watched this over 45 years of pastoring people, trust me, they have to learn to deal with their issues. Many will never. They justify their issues or it's somebody else's fault or die to an agenda. All of those will interfere with offering your body a living sacrifice. So we used to say it over and over again. Okay, this is Kingdom Life Church. We're here to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, to offer your body to go from child to young man to adult. All right? But you will have to deal with your issues and die to agendas or it doesn't work. We've had people come to church, they have an agenda. They're not here because they're part of us or they're knit together or want to be. They have an agenda. I, 
prophesy in the name of the Lord Jesus those agendas are going to die even this day. God will expose them by the Holy Spirit to you. And secondly, issues. The blame game died when you became a Christian, if you are in fact a real Christian. The blame game. You deal with your own issues. You be the best person you can be and you quit trying to change somebody else. All right? So now, how could the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man, how could Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John minister to me today? Matthew, the king, the king in the kingdom. Oh, it's so beautiful. Even in the Didache, we saw that the way the early apostles of Jesus taught Gentiles who were clueless. And trust me, we've got people that are clueless when they come to church. All right? In that cluelessness, they taught them over and over stuff that later would be in the Gospel of Matthew. Look at the Didache on their be teaching them proper behavior. This is right, this is wrong, don't do this, don't do that, you know, that kind of thing. But you will eventually see it in Matthew. So I want to pray right now that the purpose of Matthew's gospel to speak to us as individuals is the king and the kingdom, the lion. And God is speaking even right now for the king and the kingdom. Are you seeking first the kingdom? You cannot seek first the kingdom without seeking first the king. There's no kingdom without a king, okay? Seek first the kingdom. And then the beautiful part is if you truly die to your agenda that was other than seeking first the kingdom of God, he brings them to you in a way that is, brings satisfaction and blessing to other people. So, Father, right now, let Matthew minister to those of, those of you who are watching Perhaps I've had an agenda. I wanted this and I wanted that and I looked here and I looked there to find where could I go to get my agenda met. Where in reality you would have been better off dying to your agenda and letting God bring to pass. He knows what you need before you even ask. So Father, right now, the king and the kingdom, for those that have gotten off track on an agenda or have failed to even deal with their issues, we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And let me get back into the gospel of Matthew and let the king speak to me about the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. If that is my primary, one of my primary needs. Secondly, the gospel of uh, Luke. Luke talks about the man. Yes, Jesus became like man, suffered as we suffered. But Jennifer's done a, a, a wonderful teaching on the humanity of Jesus. If Luke needs to speak to us, what we need to see is our day-to-day, moment-by-moment life is not to express who we think we are, or oh, that's just the way I am. Or when, you, when we fail, what do we say? I'm only human? That's an excuse. No, that's subhuman. Luke's gospel wants to minister to us the humanity of Jesus flowing through us the fruit of the Spirit being the operative word there as the man. He taught us how to walk as a man and then a woman of God in the earth. And he still wants to do it through us. So let Luke's gospel minister to us today if we have, to, if we have a need to understanding the humanity of Jesus and how his humanity wants to express himself through us in real moment-by-moment -moment life Daily life, the mundane, going to work, you still can be that expression of that humanity. All right? And there's a lot of people that need to resemble that a lot more. They have the right answers, but not necessarily the expression to match it. Remember Mahatma Gandhi? That, you know, I might have been a Christian when reading what Jesus said until I saw Christians. What was the failure there? It was the expression of what they professed. The world's not going to believe until they see a demonstration, not just <clears throat> preaching to them. They're going to have to see the reality of changed lives, and that's what we're all about, changed lives. So there's really very low tolerance for people who won't deal with their issues and won't die to their agendas. They're just spinning their wheels. What's the third? The third one is, and I like this, it's Mark. Mark is the ox, the servant. Uh, and in serving, that means in everyday, moment-by-moment moment life. I had this concept as a young Christian that it was worship, prayer, 
witness, worship, prayer, witness, fellowship. But I failed that when I wanted to do yard work, that somehow I couldn't bring God into yard work because that was like too, oh, well, preference. There was a preference that had to die there. I don't like to do it, all right? But God was saying that the, the, the servant of the Lord does everything as unto the Lord, even those things that don't seem too important. Even those things that don't seem like, oh, well, so what's that? And yet those can be pivotal directives. So, Father, we pray right now for those who really haven't understood that reasonable service, as Jennifer said, reasonable service is to offer your body a living sacrifice and be in every, every step of the way as God would want you to walk. I want to walk in the plans and purposes that God has had for me. And I want to, if I have need in this area, I'm going to get into Mark's gospel and see the emphasis of the servant and how it applies to me. Jesus said, take my yoke upon me and learn from me. There's what the oxen is the, is the servant. And I am meek and lowly of heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. If you're working too hard, if you're burning out with Christianity, trust me, you're in the flesh. You're trying too hard. God never asked you to try. He asked you to trust. And that would direct your path. And then lastly, and probably my favorite, is John, the eagle, the deity, God incarnate. If your religion lacks the intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, intimacy is the foundation, not head knowledge. You walk without intimacy, and, and you're just an accident going somewhere to happen. You can have all the right answers and miss the answer, which is Jesus. So, Father, right now, let the Gospel of John speak to us about, about unity and intimacy and how that God's looking, when he says truth, he, that coincides with the word reality. They're one and the same. Reality is me and Jesus, and that they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. Let John's gospel minister effectively if we see the need for deeper intimacy with God. You cannot skip it. You cannot skip intimacy. I knew men that were even uncomfortable with the term intimacy in a biblical context. There's something seriously wrong there. You need to get into John and find out what intimacy really is. All right? Because it's touching spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath. So, Father, we just pray for those watching that even now, let those four Gospels speak to the areas in your life as you deal with them individually. In Jesus name. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.